Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Parents, just some godly advice. You know, I wish at three years old, like Riley, I was giving God an offering. <laughs> you know, I told you guys the story about how in 2000 and, was it three now or, or four, either 2003 or four, when I started tithing regularly for the first time. I, I remember 2003, my tithe was about 48 pounds, I remember. And for two months consecutively, I, I gave my tithe. And then on the second month, I said, God, where's my breakthrough? Thank you. And God cracked the joke with me. God said, son, you're the first person in your entire generational line that has ever tithed. He said, you your father didn't tithe. Your grandfather didn't tithe. Your great grand said, nobody in your history has tithed. And now on the basis of 48 pounds times two, you want me to say, shut up and continue. Amen. He said, this was a joke, but he said, you're paying back arrears. <laughs> but even if, see, as a parent, if you were going to give God, let's say on average, let's say you're going to give God 10 pounds in church and you have a child, divide it into two. Give that child five pounds and you give five pounds. Amen. Start from there. Amen. Teach them to start to relate with God on the basis of giving. Teach them to start to connect with God and lay up sacrifices for themselves from a young age. To trick them if necessary, calculate what, no, multiply their pocket money by 110% and give them 10% extra and teach them to tithe on it. Amen. Amen. So people are looking at me a bit. If the child's pocket money was going to be, say, 90 pounds, give him 100. Let him tie the 10 and keep the 90. These are habits they will thank you for in their future. These are things that will open up doors of heaven over them that you will not be able to. Someday that child will be in a position where you cannot help. No matter how rich you are, no matter how blessed you are, you will not be able to be there for them every step of their life. And they need to learn how to teach them to pray early. Amen? Early. If, when that child is a baby, let the child be in the room while you're praying. At one year old, blah, blah, sit down, tell them we are praying. See, these are habits that will serve them well for the rest of their life. Teach them how to fast. Maybe you're thinking, huh? Yeah, teach them how to fast. The Bible says in Joel chapter 2 that even the baby sucking at the breast. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying be that, you know, that was a serious situation. But, you know, I think a five-year-old child should be able to have breakfast two, two, two hours late in the morning, once in a while. Just one, every, well, one hour late. Just once in a while. A 10-year-old child should be able to stay till 12 noon, one day every month. I said, we are fasting. Riley, God bless you. Put it there, put it there. God bless you. God bless you. You're a good boy. It will be well with you. you know, teach them these things from a young age. Let it be part of their nature as they grow. They will thank you someday. Amen. 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 Somebody put your hands together for God. <clears throat> Hallelujah. get out your Bibles this morning I want to take you on a little journey this is the first Sunday of the year thank you Pastor Paul this is the first Sunday of the year and I just want to relay a foundation somebody say relay a foundation Amen. I've said that that young man's going to preach here someday. 
I'm looking forward to it. I'm a very purpose-oriented person. You know, I, I uh, you know, contrary to popular voice, I've said this before. I want to start an association one day called Pastors Against Church. Yeah, say pastors in protest against church. Because I hate what church has become. And every so often I talk to someone who shares my heart. And you know what? My heart breaks because I can't correct them for hating church. Deep down on the inside. Because I understand exactly how they feel. In 2000 and in the year 2000, February 25, the year 2000, was when I received my call into ministry. February 25, I remember like yesterday in the year 2000. How many years ago now? 13, almost 13, isn't it? God and I had a conversation and I said on one condition, I don't want to pastor a church. <laughs> I can do anything else. I'll travel. I'll preach, I'll lay hands, I'll spit in people's faces. You know, I'll watch them fall down. You know, I won't put my leg in the way so they trip over me so it looks like I'm anointed, you know. But I'll, I'll do all that, I'll counsel, I'll, I'll just, I just don't want the hassle of having to pastor a group of people day in, day out. I don't want to have a Sunday, Sunday ministry. You know why? Because I hate routine. I can't stand it. You come to my house, it, it's, I'm always rearranging it. You know, I'm, I just, I hate the same thing over and over and over again. And I could sleep through most of the church services. In fact, when I was in, when, when I was in, if, you, if you go a few steps back, when I was in high school at the time, even as a prefect, I used to, I used to skip church. I was, I was pretty much, we, we didn't call it SU in my school, but I was pretty much the, the president of the scripture union or, the, or the, the Christian fellowship of my high school. I was the pastor of the school, but I used to skip church. Every Sunday morning, I would dress up, act like I was walking to the bus, hide behind a classroom with my Bible, wait for the bus to go. I don't recommend you do this. You know, and, and parents, I'm teaching you what your children do. So, you know, uh -huh. Man, take note. You know, hide behind the classroom, take my Bible, pray until they came back. And then when they came back, just join them and walk into the dormitory as if. Because I hated it. I could, I could, I, I slept, walked through an entire service. A friend of mine told me, You stood up, I'm not particularly castigating any particular church. But this church was, because it was the same across the board, this church was a Catholic church. A friend of mine told me, you stood up at every point, said every rosary, every prayer, went forward for communion, and I couldn't remember the service afterwards. I slept through it. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. I slept through an entire service, standing, sitting, praying, taking communion. I said, no, son, I said, any service I can sleep through, I don't want to be going to. And so when God says, oh, you know, I want you to do the same thing, I thought, no, leave them on, leave them on. I thought, no, 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 no. Um, that's not right. Someone said, that's not right. It's not right. And then God began to teach me about what church should look like on his terms. I haven't learned everything yet, but I'm still learning. And the more I learn, the less content I am. Who put, off the, who put off these lights? Can we put them back on, please? The more I learn, the more discontent I am. I have spiritual sons who run ministries who would rather die than call what is obviously a church a church. They meet on a weekly basis, amen? They take tithes and offerings. They preach. They counsel. But they, if you mention it to them that their ministry is a church, they will fight you. Because they have been abused and castigated by the institution we call church.
tell the average unbeliever um, we're having a Christian event and they might show up. Tell them, come with me to church and watch the way their faces change. Because that word has been abused. Someone say it's been raped. Say it, it's been raped. And so I was talking to one of them, one of, you know, one of these, uh, these pastors, you know, I was, I was talking, telling you about a son of mine, and I said, see, have you ever seen a fake $9 bill? Why haven't you seen a fake $9 bill? Because there's no original. So the proof of the existence of the original is the existence of the fake. Amen. Amen. Come on, somebody talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. This is the first, this is the first Sunday of the year. I don't know, I don't, no, 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 don't do this to me this year, amen. Someone say, I repent. Say, I repent this year. I uh, repent from sitting down like tomato. You know, in my mother's culture, they have something called moi moi. Uh -huh. But you guys sit down like moi moi sometimes. Okay. I said, we are not going to surrender an eternal institution because of the existence of the counterfeit. I said, we should stop calling them churches. We should call them this. I said, nope. I said, the word church is an eternal institution. Ephesians chapter 3, let's go there. Let's, let's start our journey from there this morning. This year, my assignment in ministry, I stole it from my brother Alexander Victor. It's simple. His ministry says they are called to redefine worship on God's terms. I told him, sir, this year, I am called to redefine church on God's terms. Somebody say redefine church on God's terms. And for every one of us who is a part of this house, that is our assignment. Amen. Are you with me this morning? Are you, are you tired or sleepy? Okay, you better not be. This year we are called to redefine church. Someone say church. On God's terms. Ephesians 3 verse 9. Let's start from verse 8. In fact, you know what? Let's just start from verse 7. The title of my message this morning is The Apostolic Church. I'm going to say The Apostolic Church. The Apostolic Church. It says, Whereof I was made a minister, this is Paul speaking now, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. If this was a minister's training conference, I would go into that verse. That would be my text for today because what this is saying is you have no business starting a structure for God if you have not been made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto you by the effectual working of his power. What it means in essence is you don't put a signboard by a few instruments, amen, say X, Y, Z church and expect things to work well. At the risk of sounding arrogant, let me say this, part of the problem the average Christian has with church is that many churches have no business existing. Hear me? I'm an accountant by training. In the accounting profession, we have standards and awarding bodies. We have the ACA, the ACCA, we have the, uh, the, the IFA, the In Institute of Financial Analysis, we have SEMA, uh, the Chartered Institute of Management. All, all, all AAT, so many different standards and bodies because no self-respecting accountant wants to be given a bad name by a quark. Are you with me? No self-respecting lawyer who has gone through years of training and standardization wants to be given a bad name because of some journey come lately who has never been to law school, doesn't understand a thing about law, or even if they have, are so disintegrous and are so shabby in the way they portray or defend their clients. And that's why, uh, what you call them now, uh, organizations will dismember individuals that give them a bad name. Are you with me? If you are caught as a lawyer being corrupt, well, if you're caught 
publicly because we know what happens under the scenes. But if you're caught so publicly that you cannot be defended and it cannot be swept under the carpet, what happens? You lose your membership of the bar. And, and the bar will say, we do not associate with this individual any longer. If you're a doctor who is caught involving in corrupt practices, amen, the, the, the GMC will wash their hands off you and revoke your license and say, we want nothing to do with this one. So it, it offends me when I see people raped and minds abused in places called churches under people called ministers such that when they leave, they're spoiled, they're damaged. I found that it's better to find a person who's never known Christ before and start with them from scratch than try and correct a Christian who has been... Dis uh, God help me. A Bible college degree doesn't qualify you to be a minister. Hello, somebody. The fact that somebody laid hands on you doesn't qualify you to be a minister. The fact that you have a calling from God itself does not qualify you. And especially when it comes to governing a local church. We're all ministers. Amen. We're all called to preach the gospel. But the Bible says, Paul says, I am made a minister according to first the gift and secondly the grace, the empowerment of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. It takes grace to run a house of God. And God's people said, unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given. How do you access this grace? By humility. Somebody say humility. Say humility. So, first of all, this year, we must be a house where the gift and the grace of God is on clear display. But we must also be a house where the pillars and foundations are enshrouded in humility. Somebody say humility. Humility. Let's keep going. Now that's just for, for the leaders and ministers among you. In quote, everybody. Look at your Say you're a leader and a minister. Okay. Paul says, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. The job of an apostolic church is to preach among the Gentiles or the Jews the unsearchable riches of Christ. I said this before. I said this at, at, at threshing floor on Friday and I'll say it again. A church is a school. Somebody say school. And a hospital. Say hospital. Why do you come to church every week? To shout, to dance. I mean, if you come for the entertainment, fine, good. I mean, you might as well come here than go to the club. But if you want to do is get your groove on. And I was telling somebody recently, if you want to lose weight, just play some fast worship music in your house and wiggle and jiggle many of you to sit down in church like two bags of cement would actually do your health some good if you moved a little bit but if that's all you want to do you can get a personal trainer but if you don't want to pay the money fine come to church you know come and dance here rather than in the club bumping and grinding that's fine but beyond that the primary reason why church exists is to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ Christ is a toolbox and it is the job of the saints of God in unison on a weekly basis, monthly basis, however you do it, to unpack these riches. Somebody say unpack. Somebody say unpack. It's my job, for instance, to show you something about Christ. Not about my opinion. Not about your prosperity. That's a part of the package. But something about Christ this week you did not see last week. Paul said this grace is given to preach, to explain, to teach, to train, to raise up in the unsearchable riches of Christ. But this is where I'm going. Verse 9. To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Someone say the mystery. To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God. So there is a mystery, the Bible says, 
which from the beginning of the world has been hidden God. This is the same God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Now what is this mystery? Verse 10. For the purpose that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church. Somebody say the church. The manifold wisdom of God. Are you with me? According verse 11 to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. To the purpose verse 10 that now this is the mystery that when now when now when is now if you read this yesterday when would now have been if you read it today when is now if you read it tomorrow when is now so what does now mean at any point in time it's present continuous amen that now did you get that let me let me let me, let me explain that if you read this in 2005 and you read this now when would now have been that would have been 2005 right if you read this in 2015 when will now be so what does now mean at any point in time right at that particular point in time the bible says that now it should be made clear to the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places the manifold wisdom of god through the church but the bible says this mystery was an eternal mystery Meaning God's, in God's mind, the church was not an afterthought. Are you with me? In God's mentality, what you and I call church has always existed even before Adam fell. The word is ecclesia in Greek. It means from which we get the name Ecclesia Kingdom Center. You know, we just called ourselves a church kingdom center. That's what it means. That's why we don't need someone said, Why don't you put why don't you call Ecclesia Kingdom Church? I said, No, 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 the Ecclesia takes care of it already. Amen. It means a called out group of people from amongst another set of people who have been reindoctrinated to go back into where they came from and establish the purposes of a government among the people. It literally means Senate or House of Parliament. Literally. You are taken from your constituency to deliberate and discuss with the government the issues that affect your constituency so you can go back with the government's resources to make things the way the government wants in your constituency. Does that make sense? So in black and white, if there is a church in Nottingham, it is a group of people that have been called out of Nottingham, amen, who have been summoned to church in court to deliberate and receive and, t- and be taught and learn and experience the resources, the power, the glory, the culture, the lifestyle, the thinking, the, 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 the ability, the anointing, the presence of the government of heaven. Amen. And to bring it down to Nottingham and enforce it on their environment. Does that make sense? Somebody say church. So the concept of church is eternal in God's mind. God says, I want you to show the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Show the demonic forces that rule and govern the earth my mind, my wisdom. Literally, I want you to be my expression on the earth. And nowhere in scripture do you see the word church used about one person or two. The word ecclesia is a group word. It is a collective word. It is a pack mentality. God says, I want a group of people to walk and commit their lives to me over a period of time and allow me in part and infuse the culture, the power, and the nature of my government through them so they can be me on the earth. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay. Hebrews chapter 3 says, verse 1, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Hebrews 3 verse 1. This is my message this morning. Therefore, brethren, partakers of the, holy, of the heavenly calling. Somebody say heavenly calling. Paul is writing to a church in 
Well, we don't know where the church is. He just calls it the letter to the Hebrews. Probably to the church in Jerusalem. He says, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Somebody say heavenly calling. The word calling in Greek is the word kaleo. It means RSVP or it means invitation. So it means IV. It literally means an invitation into something. Paul says, church, you are partakers of a heavenly calling. Somebody say partakers. Say partakers. Say partakers. The word to partake literally means to have an inheritance in and to eat of. It means to have access to a dining table, the right to sit down at a dinner table and take what is on the table without being, without the need for invitation. Paul says, holy brethren. First of all, brethren. Someone says brethren. Not holy people, holy brethren. The first distinguishing DNA of a church or the church is family. Jesus tells the father on his way to heaven. He says, make them one even as you and I are one. He tells them, by this, love one another. By this will all men know that you're my disciples. Not by your anointings, not by your giftings, not by your fire, not by your tongues, not by people getting slain, not by healings or miracles. What will make people know you're my disciples? That you love one another. Holy brethren, not scandalous brethren, not lustful brethren, not gossiping brethren, not fighting brethren, amen. Not, not pornographic brethren, not, 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 not alcoholic brethren. You get, you get what I'm trying to say? It says holy brethren, first distinguishing factor of a church is this you have a group of people who love each other and are committed to a journey of holiness they don't have all to be there yet in fact when they show up they should not all be there yet if everybody who ever comes to a church is perfect then it's not a church any longer and for those of us looking for the perfect church when you get there you will make it imperfect If you're looking for a perfect church, when you arrive there, it will cease to be perfect because of you. Because you are not perfect, are you? But there should be a group commitment to perfection. Holy brothers, you are partakers of a heavenly calling. As a unit, you have been invited to transition and take of eat from the table of heaven does that make sense you're not being invited to come and clap every Sunday morning no 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 no. the clapping is a means to an end you've not come to give an offering every Sunday morning there'd be no need for your offering if the church didn't exist so you don't start something to get something that the thing you started requires does that make sense you understand that? You don't say, okay, you know what? We're going to start a church and to maintain the church, we're going to need some offering. So let's start the church for the thing that we need to maintain what we started. That, that's the wrong way of thinking. Amen. There'll be no need for, 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 for a youth ministry. So you don't start a church. Does that make sense? It, it's, it's, we have things the wrong way around in Christianity. We focus on the things that are necessary because of what we're doing, not why what we're doing is necessary in the first place. The only reason why we have a counseling ministry is because you exist. So you don't start a church to counsel people because there'd be nobody to counsel if there was no church. Are you with me? There'll be no need for an usher if there was no church. So pastors, you can't focus on the departments in your church. There'd be no need for a microphone and speakers if there was no church. So that cannot be the primary focus of a church. Are you with me? You are called as holy brothers and sisters to be partakers of a heavenly calling. Heavenly calling, meaning God is saying there is a table set for you in heaven. There's a buffet up there in the spirit realm as a group, not as individuals. Oh, I can do it on my own. No, you can't do it on your own. There are some journeys you are never called to take on your own. 
The Bible says that we may comprehend with all the saints. Someone say all the saints. The depth, the width, and the height of the love of God. There are some things about God that are only comprehended in a corporate setting. Are you with me? There is a reason why the Holy Ghost did not fall in everybody's individual house on the day of Pentecost. Jesus said, all of you get together in one room. Are you with me? Why? Because God understands that beyond what you can read or study or sing, there is a dynamic of a pack mentality that is called to spur you on to perfection. As I rub shoulders with Natalia on a daily basis, both positively and negatively, she's spurring me on to the heavenly calling. When I'm weak, she makes me pray. And when I've forgotten how to love, she forces me to love because she's unlovable. Both dimensions spur me to heavenly callings. Are you with me? There is a corporate identity. And this is why church has not worked. Because it has become a social club. A religious exercise. It's Sunday morning. What do I do? I carry my bag and my Bible, you know. Oh, I bought a new dress. You know what? Well, let me just show them, you know, how. You know, you know, I bought my new suit and tie. You know, can I just launch it? You know, I bought my new whip. Amen. I've, I've cleaned the wheels. They're shining. You know, I want, I want to get to church early. You'd be shocked why people come to church early sometimes, you know. I can get a good parking spot near the door. Everybody can walk by my, you know, my whip, my car, my automobile, you know, for the older ones among us, you know. I walk by my whip, my ride, sorry, you know. Aha. I want to be at the front so when my hat begins to blow in the air conditioning, everybody will know that the angels are around. I wonder why people wear clothes to church that are not comfortable. You, you, you can't move in it. You, you keep adjusting. They don't wear it. Wear shoes. They're like, God, just take them off and, you know, do what I do. I come to church with two pairs of shoes. I have a knockabout dancing pair and I have a preaching pair. When it's time to dance, Sometimes I forget to change them. And I get to the pulpit, I'm like, snap. For the preaching pair have been blessed. They speak in tongues. And only I know the only I have the interpretation. There is, there must be a reason why we do what we do. Let me give you an analogy from the life of Jesus. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 3, if you read that verse down, verse 1, let's finish the verse. That's where I was going. So, your holy brethren, you are partakers of a heavenly calling. You are being invited corporately to pursue something. Amen. And it says, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession or our faith. Now, Jesus in this scripture is referred to as an apostle. I want to say apostle. The word apostle means emissary, messenger, ambassador, sent one. There are many analogies for Christ in scripture. But my favorite one as a pastor is the apostle. And this is why. An apostle's job is, in fact, let me, let me explain what the word apostle is to you. In the Roman kingdom, when Caesar wanted to take over a new territory, They'd get a ship, a big ship. They put in it soldiers to fight militarily when they get there. They put in it doctors, lawyers, poets, uh, bankers, uh, uh, artists, uh, singers. One or two of every single facet of the Roman society. Right? And send them to that land. When they got there, they would first, if, if the people surrendered, there was no need. If there was a conflict, the soldiers would take care of that. After conquering the place, the people that came in the boat would now infiltrate the culture and make it look like Rome. This was the test Caesar gave every general. When I come to visit the territory, don't destroy its individuality. Don't, kill, don't make everything look exactly the same. 
But I want there to be enough of room in it that when I come there, I can be comfortable. That was the test. They give them about a year. They changed the educational system, changed the sports system, changed the music, changed everything. They, they built Roman baths and Roman coliseums such that when Caesar came to visit, usually at no, no, no earlier than a year later, Caesar would say, I feel comfortable. If he doesn't feel comfortable, keep going. Does that make sense? Now, what do you think the word apostle or who do you think the word apostle describes in that boat? Great question. Of all the people in the boat, who do you think was called the apostle? Any answers? Nicole, who do you think was called the apostle in the boat? Just take a guess. A wild guess. General, no, not the general. Esther? The ship itself. Who told you? (laughs) The ship itself was called the apostle. Let that sink for a second. Let that sink for a second because that will, that will destroy your mind regarding the titles we bear about in the body of Christ. The ship that contained both the soldiers and the people who are supposed to infiltrate was called the apostle. The sent one, the sent vessel is what it means. A sent vessel. The same in our culture. The office of the apostolic whether it be a person or in this case a church is to be a container of heaven are you with me the warfare of heaven that's how we wage war in heaven amen the music of heaven the culture of heaven dare I say the dressing of heaven amen you don't walk up into God's presence dressed anyhow like Pastor Jacques said on Facebook a few months ago, I just split my sides. It's not Nando's. Don't come offering breasts and thighs. I can understand new, I can understand new Christians, new believers. But workers, leaders in church, you're, 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 you're bursting out. Whatever you need to cover with a shawl probably shouldn't be worn in the first place. You need to keep a scarf on it and just wear something else. You know? Guys too, I'm talking to you. you know, all these tight things where everything is bulging. And please, it's a house of God. There's a way we dress in heaven. I'm serious. You will not get to heaven and see an angel wearing a low crop spark top. With cleavage showing, I guarantee you. You will not see an angel wearing tight leather spandex hugging his crotch. Mm Mm-mm, nah. There's a way we behave in heaven. We don't gossip about each other. We don't talk about each other behind our backs. We don't say, did you hear what so-and-so did? (laughs) We need to pray. No, we go to the person and we say, I heard what you did. Do I need to pray? I've said that I'll give you permission in this house. If somebody calls you gossiping, tell them, put them on, on, on hold. Call the other person. Put them on a three-way call and say, so-and-so has something they would like to say to you. Somebody comes to talk about somebody else, you ask them, have you spoken to the person? If they say, no, I don't want to hear, we're going to talk to them first. Because the Bible says if you have something against your brother, sit down with him and try and resolve it. Then bring maximum two people with you. Maximum two. Maximum. Maximum. Don't bring the whole church. And after that, then bring the elders. And if that still doesn't work, then you can run your mouth. There's a way we talk in heaven. We don't talk too much. We're not lousy. Somebody once said, I was Abraham Lincoln, uh, uh, better to keep quiet and be thought of fool than to speak up and remove all doubt. Yeah. 
If in doubt, shut up. Heavenly. Because it's heavenly. Heavenly. God instructed the Israelites, make sure your camp is clean. Don't say clean. It is not heavenly to be dirty. Oh. Clean your house. Brush your teeth. When you lift up holy hands in worship, let's know that if we get slain, it's the anointing, not the annoying thing. Hello. There is a financial system in heaven. Jesus, God himself, does a miracle. And there are 12 baskets of leftovers. And he tells his disciples, pick up every single fragment. No waste. My money and I can spend it how I want to. You will soon not have any. Study the lives of rich people. You'll be shocked how little they waste. Study rich people. They're not, they don't love money, but they don't, they're not afraid of money, meaning they, they, they don't not spend it when it needs to be spent. And I learned that from my father and my mother. They told me separately, individually. He's here today. He said, you pay for comfort. There are things you must spend money on. Money is currency. It flows. Amen? So poverty is you need to spend something, and because you're too poor, you're afraid to spend it. Money doesn't come to people like that. I learned. Seriously. Money doesn't go where it's, afraid, it's it, there's fear of it. So for instance, you need to buy something and you have the money and you're afraid where will the money come from tomorrow? You will soon be poor. Money will leave you to find somebody who's bold. So your rent is due today, but then your car insurance is due tomorrow. Pay the rent today and believe God for the insurance to money. Amen. That's one side of prosperity. But the flip side is you don't spend money on things you don't need. Because it's not your money. It's God's. It's, you are a steward of it. And it can disappear in an instant. And regularly God will sit you down and say, let's give account. What have you done with my money? Another habit of most rich people, even the atheists and the pagans, they're very generous. Forget church. I'm not talking about church now. Forget church. They give money to people. Because they understand that not everything that comes my way is for me. told some women recently who were complaining. I was, I was in a place where some women were complaining about how their husbands, you know, are always spending money. I said, see, if that man stops spending money on people outside your home, there will soon be no money to spend in your home. The reason why there's money for you to be running your mouth is what he's doing. So, hey, hey, we have children and, and he's... Spe- no, no, he's securing your children's future. The Bible says he that gives to the poor is lending to God and God will repay he didn't say the righteous man that gives to the poor. Even the ritual killer or the rapist that gives to, to the poor is lending to God. That's why you Christians are broke and unbelievers are prospering. Because you do not learn the culture of heaven. The Bible says the, the, the people of darkness in their generation are wiser than the children of light. They have their system and they work their system. The system says you steal, you cheat, you bribe, and you save. But even their system tells you give money. I grew up in Africa, amen, where things happen that many of you have never known before. I am from a city where 10-year-olds lift up their shirts, throw them in the air, and they hang. So I know what I'm talking about, amen. Aha, uh-huh. that's where I'm from. I understand that not everything, not everything that flies over your head is an airplane. Talk to me, someone. Not every winged creature is a bird. You get what I'm trying to say? Uh, when the Bible says, no, no, I mean, uh, well, how does it go again now? No, 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 the song, well, how does it go again now? The arrows, how did the Bible put it again now? Psalm 121, Psalm 91. About destruction at waste at new day, at noonday, where you see you literally see arrows moving over your head, looking for someone to hit. And when you go to those witch doctors and tell them I want to get rich, they will tell you once a month 
throw a party and spray money. They will tell you, distribute it. Because even the devil knows that's the only way to prosper. Honor your father and your mother. And it shall. Who, who here wants to prosper? It's so simple. An idiot could do it. Honor your father and your mother that it may be well with you. Someone say simples. My father's a billionaire. I don't care. Buy him a tie once every two months. Honor him. Oh, well, I respect him. No, 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 no. Malachi chapter 1 makes it very clear. Very clear. If I'm a father, where is my honor? If I'm a master, where is my fear? And then God makes it very clear what the honor is. If you take that stupid thing you gave to me, to your governor, would he accept it from you? Who won't say honor. People have given me, and people have given me, and I'll say, it's, it's okay, you know, I've said this before. I, I, everybody gives at their level, right? But please, give at your level. Remember when I was a campus pastor in university, people would give me shirts. Now, students were broke, so they didn't have money to buy new shirts. So they would give me as their pastor shirts that they'd worn before. I could handle that. But don't give me a shirt with a tongue collar. Literally, a shirt with the collar is ripped. And the one you're wearing is fine. Hello. Some of us have parents dying of hunger somewhere in the world. Or we're going to Nando's every blessed day. The parents gave their life savings to get you a visa. You're here working, spending your money on stupidity, on some girl who doesn't even like you. And your mom and dad are drinking, I don't know what they drink in your place. Where I come from, they call it Gary. And do you guys, do you, do, is, it, is that something, you guys put sad, imagine putting sad sign water and sugar. It's my hell, aha. Pardon? My hell, aha. Your mom and dad are drinking my hell. It's Christmas. You can't even send money to buy one chicken. But one drumstick. And you're taking your boys out for dinner. You're buying drinks for everybody. You're, you're, you, what, pause, just wait. When that woman who gave birth to you starts the cry of hunger, that voice will judge you. Someone say heaven. Actually, I got sidetracked. You know, this was for next week. I was going to talk to you about proper kingdom financial principles. You know, but I just got sidetracked. But the point I'm trying to make you this as I close, as I close is this. We are called as a church to influence our generation and our environment with the fragrance of heaven. That, please God, help me out. That's our assignment. Somebody say assignment. It's our assignment. That's why we exist. Meaning it will not always be nice and easy. It will not always be convenient. But we must remember we don't exist for ourselves. We exist, like I said on Friday, to transition and then to provide a platform for the world around us to experience the culture of heaven. So that's why we preach to teach you the rules of heaven. That's why we worship to expose you to the atmosphere and the power of heaven. Amen. That's why we do fellowship with one another so we can encourage ourselves in the journey of heaven. We are called to be an apostolic church. We are called to be that vessel that brings the culture of Rome to the colony of Nottingham. So church meetings are just lecture classes and training camps. That's why you don't just decide I'm not coming to church today. Because you don't know what's going to be released. I heard on Thursday how the place went wild and God was just healing people for fun. And that's the day some people, it, it, it always breaks my heart how people miss churches or church on the day usually. 
where as a pastor you know they should be there. Amen. And I've said this a thousand and one times before. I have preached <laughs> I've preached to places multiple times the capacity of this room by the grace of God. And I've preached in churches of four and five. And I am just at ease with either. Amen. I've stood in churches whose platforms are bigger than our entire building, our entire sanctuary. Amen. And I've preached in churches where the entire church could fit in half of our own platform. And God has moved both times. In fact, some of the greatest miracles I've seen in ministry have been in churches where two or three are gathered. I'm telling you. I've seen blood infections healed in a service where there were only four people present in addition to the people I brought with me. That's why when I travel, I like to take my own people with me, you know. So no matter how bad it is, you know, you have backup. I've been in a place where it's the pastor, their wife, their child, and one other person. And so I just saw it as a leadership training class. I took four people with me. I said, I'm going to preach to my folks to train them. You guys can benefit. And God, he- I mean, in, in that room, my people were healed, the pastor was healed, his wife was healed, his child was healed. I mean, everybody, except for me, almost everybody in the room, all eight of us were healed. Awesome manifestation. I'm saying that to say this. I'm not tripped by chairs and how many people are in them. If you think the reason why you are being, you are being cajoled to come to church regularly is so that you can sit down in a chair and look good in a photograph, you've missed it. If you think it's so that the offering basket can be a bit fuller, you have missed it. I've told you guys, there was a day before, three years ago, there were 18 people in church and the offering Agatha was £1.50. Pastor Blessing, Pastor Blessing was there, right? £1.50. And it was the best service we had in a long time. And we were paying £24 at the time to use our hall for four hours. And so when the people came to collect the money, we said, um, um, you see, we uh, didn't bring our checkbook. What we meant was we left it behind, but we couldn't lie. So we said, we did not bring the checkbook. Can we write you the check next week? And two months later, we moved here. Did you catch that? Two months later, we moved here. And we have not missed one month's payment told you it cost almost six grand a month to run this place so it's not about your offering relax tell them say chill say relax it's not about your offering it's about your destiny some of you won't be here long some of you are passing through some of your students you'll be gone after three or four years we know that we understand that some of you ladies will get married and your husband will take you out of the place true some of you will relocate to another place God will call you to start another ministry. Wherever it is, I don't, I'm not stupid enough to believe that everybody I look at will be here in the next five years. What's to say I will be here in the next five years? Who says? It's not my church. God's. I don't know how, I don't honestly know how much time I have in any way I go. I've told you guys before, this is the longest place I've spent in one place time in one place ministering three years is the longest time I've spent pastoring or leading any form of ministry in one location Jesus had three years with his disciples and he taught trained groomed imparted indoctrinated the Bible says he would teach them the parables of the kingdom the mysteries of the kingdom three years after he disappeared and it was now left to those 12 men to do what you and I see today as church they turned the world upside down in three years of association with him they downloaded every single thing they needed to take over not just jerusalem not just israel but the entire world for christ it's been three years what have you learned those of us present who have traveled for christmas you're listening on youtube when you come back i want you to ask yourself the question you've been here we've been in nottingham three years what have we imparted 
what structures of the kingdom have we built how is our city and our corporate body any more heavenly now than we were three years ago after jumping and dancing and clapping and shouting every sunday and thursday that ladies and gentlemen is the purpose of church that the face of god can be clearly displayed in his people so that the world looks at us and learns about him and his ways just by being in an encounter with us we walk down the street we see people in wheelchairs and because he's the great healer we have enough grace and boldness and time to stop and lay hands and watch them get up drug addicts come in and they sober up and beat the addiction not by mental schemes and 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 rehab programs but by the power of the presence of the holy spirit people bound in sin associate with us and feel chains breaking without being prayed for people whose altars have died in god walk into this place and by being around their passion and zeal for god begins to rise and explode homeless people become homeowners not because prosperity is preached but because the power of god is preached and it produces prosperity students who have been told they are they, they have low iqs and are dyslexic and have learning disabilities feel the quickening power of god upon their lives and go back to school and begin to do well people who are still single because of horrible characters not because you're not you know because you're not beautiful or handsome but nobody wants to marry you can we call a spade a spade can we call a spade a spade can we call a spade a spade is this family 50 percent of people who are single beyond a certain age it's not because there's a demon worrying you it's you it's you sit down and let god change your heart let God affect your ways. Let him teach you integrity and character and decency. Let him make you the kind of person someone wants to see every day of their life. Learn how to be punctual so you stop getting fired at work and saying it's racism. It's not racism. Nobody wants to hire somebody whose whereabouts they cannot vouch for at any time. You're always late. You're sloppy. You don't work hard. You're the last to come in. You're the first to leave. And you, you're not being racist. Your boss just wants someone who will give him his money's worth. Hello. Hello. Ouch. Learn to be accountable to someone for once in your life. Pastor, I'm coming late today. Or I'm going to be away for the weekend. So you don't disappear and leave a wife. And not tell her where you're going. And then when your marriage begins to crumble. You begin to fast and pray. Say it's, the, it's not the devil. It's you. Learn how to respect someone. So when you marry a man who wants to be respected. You know how to respect him. So he doesn't leave you for somebody who's twice your size. And uglier than you, but at least will talk to him in a way he wants to be spoken to. In my studies, most men who leave their wives don't leave them for somebody who looks finer than them just because they look finer than them. No, no, no. There's something that woman knows you don't. Amen. I know many people personally who have left their spouse for another person. And they know it's wrong. Many of them are Christians. But when you see them, they tell you, I just can't live with that person anymore. And when you find out the reason why, it's not spiritual, it's not the devil. It would take grace to live with someone like that. And let me help you out. And many people here, I hear this clearly from God as I close, prophetic word. And many of you who are bitter against a parent for supposedly walking out on your family, sit down and hear the full story. You're angry with your dad or your mom because you feel they abandoned your family. No, no, no. Sit down. There's always two sides to the same coin. Find out what it is your mom or dad, the one who stayed. Find out what it is about them. 
I'm not, I'm not defending it. I'm not saying it's acceptable. I believe marriage is for life. And if you marry, whatever you find, you find. That's why you pray before you get married. You said God showed you, so God must have showed you that. So you sit with it. But for the parents who do not have the grace of God, you do. Who do not know God like you do. Find out why your dad woke up one day and decided, I can't take this anymore. Before you make him a demon and a pariah. And you make up your mind that you will not repeat the same cycle. Your boy, find out how your father beat your mom senseless until she had to run away to save her life and tell yourself, I will not perpetrate the same cycle. Don't be bitter with your mom for leaving. Your woman, find out how your mother nagged your dad to death. Put him down. Made him feel like a piece of junk. Told him by her actions, you're not a man, I don't respect you, I don't regard you. And there was somebody else offering the respect she wouldn't and learn from i'm not saying be bitter against the one who stayed no just say there's a side or two sides to every coin and tell yourself i am not going to perpetuate stop destroying your destiny by holding your own parent in bitterness it won't work for you whether you like it or not they're your father who am i talking to this morning i don't know where this is coming from they're your dad their dna is in your blood the reason why your nose looks the way it is why you have the gifts and the talents are because your mother's gifting or dna is in your blood so bitterness against them won't take you anywhere amen it won't take you anywhere at all and like i said if you only sat down and heard the full story you might be shocked but church should be a place where a spiritual father and mother tell you, you see this thing you're doing, it will kill you. Where your brother and your sister have been given the license to put their nose in your business, yes. Church should be church is for busybodies, yes. It's a busybody club, yes. Your business is my business, my business is your business. If you're not going to school, if you're not going to church, if you're sitting down at home in your room day in, day out, spacing out, somebody should report you. And come and say, Pastor, yes, it's allowed. You thank them someday. Wife, if your husband is beating you senseless, come and report him. Come and report him. So he won't do it someday and the police will get involved and he'll go to jail. Amen. Parents, it is your God-given right to go into the room of a child living in your house. Hear me. It is your God-given right this is that you, you go into that room and you see something on the wall that looks occultic you speak amen it's your right don't don't it, it, and, and we will teach you how it is done in church you come in with something on your t-shirt that makes it obvious there's something wrong with you you buy a t-shirt as a christian saying look at these we'll sit you down we'll tell you when you go home and your mom tells you you'll be okay with it you will learn how to be accountable you will learn how to live in a community you will learn how to be considerate one for the other you will not come to church and speak in Swahili and Yoruba and Chui and Shona when there's a person beside you who doesn't understand what you're saying you will not do so then you complain about racism you're racist you are the racist you are the racist we black folk we're so racist sometimes you're in a room and somebody you're, you're talking in your bar kilo shele blah blah and natalia sat down there and you're talking about her over her head <laughs> means she doesn't understand she's not one of us she's not she doesn't she understand what we're saying you wonder why the person if you notice how most black churches usually are only black churches you find more white or black people in a white church than white people in a black church but we're all going to the same heaven you will learn this year let me stop there for today stand up let's pray but above all you will learn how to carry the glory of God you will learn how to walk in the presence of his power. 
you will learn how to tap into his wisdom at short notice on your job God will be glorified because you are the one always bringing solutions to business meetings do I repeat that every time your company is in a bind you will have a dream and when you bring the solution that will be what we need because you will learn how to pray for those of you who say you know I'm not called to ministry I'm called to the marketplace you will die in the marketplace if you don't have an altar of personal ministry Because every in- industry, every f- sphere of activity has a demonic altar. Hear me, somebody. You're called to be a musician or, or playwright or an actor or an actress, and you don't have a prayer life, you'll die. You want to be a governor, an MP? You know how those guys get there? You know the, the sacrifices they make, the atrocities they commit the demonic atmosphere in that place and you want to walk in there you want to walk in there with no prayer life if you walk in the NHS lift up your hand or in some form of medical institution or the other you better pray you better pray that place is a dungeon of demons Are you aware that a certain number of people have to die every month? It's built into the system. Look, I should keep quiet. No. So this is going on YouTube, right? Are you aware? And you're a Christian nurse walking around that hall. Sima Kodama Santarama Sente. And your head nurse is a Freemason. And you wonder why you're always in trouble. You better pray. You better develop an altar that is strong enough to carry the weight of your destiny. That's the purpose of church. Finally, I want to make a request to you. I haven't finished by any stretch this morning, but will you let us build it together? Hmm? It's not perfect, I know. Because you're not perfect. Neither am I. But can we come to a conclusion that a group of imperfect people can work together as holy brethren in unity to build a perfect structure for God? Will you own it like it is yours? Will you treat it like this is your own family, your own investment, like it's your own ministry? We will join hand in hand and be committed to build God a structure his kingdom can rest on. Will we stop pointing out everything that's wrong and start to point out possible solutions? Will we learn to love each other and understand you will hurt me, I will hurt you. You'll offend me, I'll get on your nerves. Standard biological families do that to each other. But there's something that binds us together beyond our convenience, beyond the color of our skin, beyond our language. There's 12 or 13 different countries represented in this church. There must be something binding us beyond the flags that we wave, beyond our gender, beyond our occupation. It's a person, the apostle of our faith. I love him so much. You love him so much. I'm, I'm, I'm committed to him. You're committed to him. That's good enough for me. The rest are details. We work through them. Tell your neighbor the rest are details. We'll work through them. We'll get through them. Someday you'll marry someone and you'll find out you're different. And you'll have to work through the details. So you might as well learn with your Christian brother or sister. Amen. Lift up your hand. Let's, let's close. Father, first day of this year, we ask you for grace to be your model.